Hi, I'm Greg Johnson with resourcesforlife.com, and this is a brief video introducing a wellness program that addresses three critical health concerns today. One is obesity, the other is blood pressure, and the other is blood sugar. And basically, I, I want to present this in a video format um, through YouTube because, you know, it, it's time and date stamped, and that way it sort of puts this information out in the public domain. Um, I, I prefer that it not be, you know, copyrighted by anyone. I like the idea that it can be shared freely and people don't have to pay for it. So um, by putting it out there, it then serves that purpose. So this program, and let me mention at the outset, is the goal of it is to make it open source so that it is designed in a way that people know how it was developed, people know what it's involved, what are the tools that I use to develop the program, completely uh, transparent that way. And that it's also public domain, so that means that people can take this information, work with it and repurpose it, um, but without preventing anyone else from using it, right? So don't want anyone to copyright or patent or trademark or whatever, try to you know restrict the use of this so that they can make a profit. It should be propagated as, as fully as possible. Um, and open access there again, available on the web. You don't have to pay for videos. You don't have to pay for books. You don't have to, you know, pay for seminars or workshops. This is going to be open access for everybody. Um, and then it's collaborative. So I've obviously referred to a number of resources and people who've helped me put this program together. And, um, you know, there are a lot of puzzle pieces that needed to be put together. And I've introduced some puzzle pieces that I think are pretty unique uh, on my own. And that kind of paints this picture. So um, and finally, universal design is the approach that I wanted to take with this because that ensures that the program is uh, relevant and functional and effective for as many people as possible. So um, I want to talk a little bit about how I arrived at an interest in this issue and then from there where I went to come up with a solution. So briefly, um, I've always had an interest in health, always check my temperature and blood pressure and blood sugar and all of that stuff just out of curiosity. And um, with my blood sugar, it was always normal. So I got kind of bored checking blood sugar when it wasn't really changing from day to day significantly. Then uh, I went in for a, a regular annual exam and just kind of out of the blue, um, the lab work suggested that I had uh, insulin resistance or pre-diabetic or diabetic condition. And so I was really alarmed at that because I thought, well, what could have changed? You know, I've been healthy for, for years, for decades, right? So um, I mentioned to my doctor, I said, you know, I think it's something I've been eating recently. And there's some there were some things I was eating at the time that were high in sugar and even high in artificial sweeteners that can kind of throw your system out of whack. And the doctor said to me, looked at me in the face and said, you know, what you eat does not cause diabetes. Diabetes is this medical condition and there's just no way of preventing it really. <clears throat> and so uh, I thought, well, you know, doctor must know what uh, they're talking about, but um, still I was kind of curious about this. So I stopped eating these things that I'd been eating and noticed a difference. So I, I thought, you know, maybe there is something to what we eat impacting our health. Anyway, I, I came to the conclusion that sugar somehow, either directly or indirectly, does contribute to or cause <clears throat> diabetes. And I set out to try to learn more about this. Um, and, you know, be, because my doctor was concerned about my blood sugar, uh, the doctor wrote out a prescription <clears throat> for something called metformin. And I thought, well, what, you know, what could it hurt? So I started taking this product and a few days went by, a week went by started going into, you know, a week and a half, and my blood sugar just on this product started going up to like astronomical levels, like 280 something. I've never seen it like that before. So I thought, well, that product, for whatever reason, um, I needed to get off of that. And so again, not recommending you do this. I'm just sharing my experience. But once I did get off of that, my blood sugar came back down, probably dropped like by 100 points, but didn't return to what it was before. Uh, it was almost like I somehow had damaged something in my system based on whatever that product was doing. Now, a simple explanation of what could have been happening is that if that product causes your blood sugar to go down and your liver says, oh, I need to produce more sugar, there can be, there's, there are lots of things 
in terms of like insulin, your pancreas, your liver, things that are going on in your metabolic processes that can cause your blood sugar to go up even when you're not in the middle of eating a you know, candy bar or something. Um, so it's more complicated than I had the time to pursue, but I knew enough to know that wasn't normal and I wanted to get off of that thing and find a solution for myself. So that was kind of the background and the context. Um, and at that point, I wanted to develop a program that would work for me and then hopefully would work for others. So here are the three things I looked at. Um, one was sleep, the other is exercise, and finally food, okay? So with regard to sleep, um, there are some of these activity tracker devices. I use a Fitbit. There are others out there that are just as good. They track your steps. They track how many stairs you climb during the day. Um, and they also help track your sleep. So if you are using a device like this, and the Fitbit gives pretty accurate mapping of what your night looks like, so it shows when you're sleeping and not moving, it shows when you're moving a little bit, and it shows when you've actually woken up to use the restroom or get a drink of water or whatever. So you can start with a really good picture of what your sleep quality is, and then start introducing and removing things from your sleep environment. Um, if it's too bright, you know, try making the room darker. If you feel like you need a little bit of airflow, try having a fan in the room, or maybe that sound helps you sleep more restfully. Or maybe the fan in the room is causing you to feel dry and you need to get up and get a drink of water. Um, drinking too much water or, or certainly like coffee or tea or something late at night, right, would make you get up and have to use the restroom more frequently. Uh, you can look at a number of other factors, noises that might be causing you to wake up, maybe a pillow that's causing your neck to feel crooked like that, or uh, your bed's not comfortable. So there are a lot of variables you can play around with, right? And you track your sleep every night and you see what is helping your sleep improve and what's not helping your sleep improve. Um, so that's the first area, sleep. And I'll add to that, that for many people, if you have a problem with snoring or any kind of a sleep breathing obstruction, um, it could even be induced by allergies, sinus condition, uh, you put on some weight, maybe the pillow, as I mentioned, you're sleeping on a pillow and it's like crooking your neck and you're you know, trying to breathe, but you're not breathing as well. Any of these things can cause a potential um, to have less than optimal breathing at night, right? Well, if you find yourself being tired during the day and any of these other factors are at play, you can talk to your doctor and get a prescription for, um, first, a sleep study. And it's a very simple thing. You can go in and get a sleep study done. And certainly, if, if you feel like your condition may be changing, well, you may want to go in at a time when uh, you've been eating some of those foods or that are causing you to get sinus problems or if there's you know allergies or uh, pollen season is high or whatever. You have the test done at those times when you're most likely to have an issue. Um, and if the doctor feels you qualify for it, there's a sleep system that uh, might be called a CPAP or a BiPAP or an AutoPAP. Uh, it's, it creates, it does four things basically, <clears throat> okay? Number one is it humidifies your air. So you're not breathing in dry air at night, which might be causing you to wake up. It purifies the air. It filters out um, pollen or large dust particles or whatever. So you're, again, not being disrupted from your sleep because of something, impurities in the air. Um, humidity and cleaning air. And then third, it creates um, heat. So if it's cold or whatever, it's, it's conditioning the air that you breathe. So it's doing those three things. Plus, if you're snoring, particularly with the system that's called an AutoPAP, it can create pressure as needed on demand if you start to snore, if you need a little bit more airway to be breathing, it can do that for you. There's a system from a company called ResMed, R-E-S-M-E-D. It's their version 10 of this system that I'm talking about. It connects not through wireless, it connects through mobile phone to the cloud and it uploads all your data, okay, um, from a night's sleep just like the Fitbit does. The Fitbit collects all that data, uploads it to the cloud through your phone. But what this ResMed device does then is every single breath you take, that maps out to your full night's sleep. It tells you how much time you slept and what the quality of sleep was. So between a Fitbit device and one of these AutoPAP machines, 
you're going to have a really clear picture of your sleep quality and you're going to have a really clear then data uh, set of data to know when you're improving it and when it's getting worse. Um, so anyway, sleep is, you know, essential to your mood during the day, your energy level, your uh, metabolic processes. Sleep is a big component to weight loss and to blood sugar um, control and, and regulation and also to blood pressure. Okay. Um, so that's the first component I looked at. And basically what I did for myself was, I can't say that I have the answer because your solution is going to be different than mine. But my answer was the fan was causing a problem. You know, um, I actually have moved where I lived before. It was across from a police station, a fire department, a nightclub, and <clears throat> there were regular, you know, gang fights outside pretty much every other day. Um, plus people were fighting in the apartment complex. So it's kind of the worst of all situations. But by, you know, getting into a quiet environment, optimal for sleep, I was able to improve that. Um, so anyway, that, that's the sleep component. And then the second component is um, exercise. And for most people today, we're dealing with a society with a lot more technology at home and in the workplace. And that technology, whether it's games or Facebook or, you know, you're browsing the web or whatever, it's keeping you at your desk and less active. And same at work, uh, particularly myself, I do IT work. And so I am, you know, a lot less active than let's say somebody who's like a postal person out delivering the mail. Um, and, and I have to be more intentional than about my exercise. What I used to do was, you know, work out for two hours a day and run a 5k run every day. Well, that's not really practical for most people and it wasn't practical for me. So um, what I found though is in, in my situation and probably is similar to many people, I work in an office where I have uh, six flights of stairs that I can climb during the day. And I might do that every hour, every other hour. Um, and if I want to take the elevator down, go up again, so I can get in 12 flights of stairs in just a few minutes. And it really helps to regulate blood sugar because the leg muscles are the biggest muscles in the body, right? So you can go and, and do curls all day or go for a little walk or whatever, and you're not getting that intense workout that you're going to get when you exercise your leg muscles doing stair climbing. So um, first component, sleep. Second component, component exercise with a, with a focus on exercising the largest muscles in your body to burn up as much sugar in your bloodstream as possible um, so that your glucose levels are really regulated properly. And then finally, of course, is the component of this, which is the, the food. And that's kind of a growing uh, experiment for me, but I can show you some of the things that are, I think, important that have been working for me. So um, first of all, I mentioned earlier that, uh, and, and I've mentioned this in my articles as well, that with regard to food, um, sugar is essentially, according to most research, has been found to be as addictive or more addictive than cocaine or heroin. Uh, and you can just Google it and you'll find reputable sources, reputable research documenting that, okay? So it's addictive. Um, the second thing we know about sugar is that it makes us crave a lot more food than we might otherwise um, crave. So it makes you want to eat more. The third thing that sugar does is that it kind of blocks the brain receptors that tell you when you're full. And again, Google this stuff and you can find the, the documented research for it. But that's not a very good combination to be eating something that's as addictive as cocaine that's causing you to eat more, more of sugar and more of everything else. And you're not going to know when you're full. That is a formula for a disaster. And of course, um, we know that in America, we're eating more sugar than uh, we should, and that that has been researched as well. Um, some doctors would say there's no connection between sugar and diabetes, or at least they would say sugar does not cause diabetes, that really it's obesity that causes diabetes. Um, and another place where you'll hear that is the Coca-Cola company. They have a statement on their website that says the, the high sugar content in their drinks does not cause diabetes. Um, they've actually come out and said that, they say that it's really obesity that causes diabetes. Well, I would probably disagree with, with the Coca-Cola company and with these doctors, um, but whether sugar is a primary cause or a secondary cause of diabetes, it's playing and it's influencing it, right? It's causing people to become heavier because they're eating too much. Um, and you know anything that you put into your body 
whether it's sugar or alcohol or whatever, the organs that have to deal with that thing, if they are overtaxed and overburdened with whatever that thing is, they're going to get burned out. It's just, it's just, that's how it is, right? So if you're just throwing sugar at your body nonstop, your liver, your pancreas, your whole metabolic process is going to at some point just collapse. And that's, you know, sort of like adrenal failure and uh, insulin resistance comes into play uh, when you see that happening. So anyway, um, for me with the diet, what I knew I needed to do was get sugar out of the equation. And my primary source of sugar had been like cafe mochas. You know, you get the, the chocolate, the coffee, the sugar and the milk and you mix it all together. Well, the problem with that is um, sugar normally is ingested with food and at least you have a period of time when you can process that. If you're combining caffeine and sugar, it's increasing your, your blood pressure, it's increasing your heart rate, um, and it's getting that cycling through your system faster. It's in a liquid form. It's like you might as well be injecting it into your veins. It is the fastest way to get sugar into your system uh, that I know of. And so I wanted to get rid of that sort of high glycemic index source of sugar, uh, completely eliminate that, and switch over to low glycemic index foods, um, which that diet's been around for 50 years, but enhance that by going with low carb foods. So not only was it low glycemic index, but low carb and virtually no sugar or you know five grams or less of sugar in whatever foods I might be eating. Um, and by combining these three things, I mentioned sleep, I mentioned the stair climbing, every couple hours, five to 10 flights of stairs, and going with a low glycemic index, low carb diet, those three things um, is what then essentially resulted in my blood sugar going from you know, over 300 down to below 100, uh, as I've written about in these articles. And um, the, the way I was able to map all of this out, and I, I showed one little tool here earlier is the Fitbit, um, the way I was able to map out a solution that worked for me, and your solution may be different, right? You're a different person, you have a different workplace, a different home life, etc. You'll have to find your own solution, but I think what I'm sharing will be a lot of help. Um, the way I mapped out my own solution was by taking really close track of my blood sugar, my glucose levels throughout the day. Uh, when I wake up in the morning, before meals and after meals, and sometimes after exercise, because I tried a lot of different exercises, and what I realized was stair climbing, at least for me, was a super powerful way to regulate the glucose, okay? Well, to do that, um, you know, health insurance companies do not pay for these little testers and these little test strips. Uh, they simply don't cover the cost. So um, unless you're diagnosed as being diabetic, and then they will cover the cost of one little test strip you know, per day. And then if you need insulin, eh, they might pay for a few more of those test strips. So it's, it's a very reactive situation. They're going to wait until you're seriously sick, and then they'll give you some tools. Well, you're going to have to take that in your own hands if you really want to find out how your food, how your sleep, and how your exercise are impacting your glucose levels. Um, a pack of 100 test strips like this used to cost $140. And up until very recently, up until really the time that I started writing about this issue. And CVS Pharmacy came out with a box of 100 for $22. So that was, you know, undercutting all these other companies that were selling them for $100, $120, $140 for a box of 100. They were selling them for 22. That really makes it more accessible for people to go out, get a bunch of test strips and for, you know, $17, $18, get a little test kit. I would recommend using a couple of these. Um, and then you can start testing your glucose levels throughout the day without shelling out a lot of money. Um, and it's going to take a while for the insurance companies to catch up with this. So currently, again, even though it's only 22 cents, you know, they don't want to shell out the money, even though we've given them billions. But I don't want to go down that path. Anyway, uh, point is, you're going to have to probably buy some of these yourself. And then the reason for having two test kits is... Um, Usually they'll be very accurate. And sometimes when you take, you, you just you know put a little prick on your finger with the, this little device here and um, you 
have the test strip inserted in this little tester. You touch it to the blood, drop of blood, and it gives you a readout, right? And normal is kind of between 80 and 110 or somewhere around in there. Um, normally that reading will be the same on both meters. That's what it should be. There are variations, you know, your blood sugar is changing throughout the day and, you know, it's not always identical in every little spot on your body. So um, there will be variations even within the same test, right? So by taking those two readings, if one of them says it's 98 and the other says it's 102, you can be pretty sure of what the reading should be. Sometimes you'll take two readings and one might say 98 and the other will say 140. Well, that means maybe you weren't you didn't clean your finger clean you know, properly or whatever, but um, that's why you need two testers is because sometimes those readings will be so far off, you need to know if you're getting an accurate one. And that's why it's really a problem that the health insurance companies only cover one test per day, typically in the morning to get your fasting glucose, um, because you really don't know what's happening throughout the rest of the day. Some people have a low glucose reading in the morning and it gets higher throughout the day. Other people have a high glucose reading in the morning and it gets lower throughout the day because of activity um, and because the body's doing what it's supposed to do to regulate blood sugar. Uh, there are a couple of conditions where people have higher blood sugar at night. Um, so that's why it really is important to kind of check that <clears throat> and, and find out where yours is. Well, for myself, by spending 22 bucks and getting about 100 you know, data points to, to analyze, I was able to figure out what changes I could make in my sleep, my exercise, and my food to produce these really good results. And what I found was then, I'm going to show you a few foods here, just kind of conclude this video, is um, instead of typical bread, which would, at least in my experience, cause my blood sugar to skyrocket, I started eating this Ezekiel bread. I just get the original. There are other um, sprouted grain breads out there. This is just the one I'm familiar with. <clears throat> but having that bread for whatever reason, seem to significantly maintain and reduce my glucose levels. So that was really a great find. Um, and <clears throat> another good source of food that uh, it's, it's relatively high in carbs, 25 grams of carbs, 5 grams of sugar, is uh, this, it's called Balela, and this one's from Pita Pal, I get this at Costco. Um, it has chickpeas in there and a bunch of other veggies, uh, black beans, onions, parsley, sun-dried tomatoes, all organic. And I like to combine that with a good organic yogurt. This one is uh, Kelowna Supernatural, but there are others out there. Um, and that combination is quite good. The yogurt's a little bit, uh, as well as this balela, is kind of vinegary, a little bit tart, you know, and that helps with getting your uh, appetite under control. Um, so the bread, this, this seaweed product from Costco, you can get, it's like seven or eight dollars, you can get a huge pack of this stuff, and um, this is really a good snack food. A, a whole packet of this would be five servings, and five servings would be 100 calories, so it's, it's really filling, right? I mean, just one of these packets expands in your stomach, and you're going to feel like you've had a whole meal, and yet you've really just had, you know, 100 calories, so that's that's a good uh, product to be considering. Um, this is another uh, product, Mary's Gone Crackers. And this, I do not know of another alternative for this. Um, they have a variety of flavors, black pepper. This one's jalapeno. There's an original. There's one that's called Super Seed. This also is relatively high in carbs, 21 grams of carbs, but no sugar. And from my experience, it seems like it's a pretty low glycemic index food. I've not noticed any spikes of blood sugar after eating um, that. And um, so those are kind of some carb sources. Here's another product from Costco. It's the quinoa tabbouleh. And um, it also is, uh, actually this one's kind of low in carbs, nine grams of carbs, one gram of sugar. So low glycemic index and low carb. Um, it has tomatoes, quinoa, parsley, onions, a bunch of other good stuff in there. Um, and I think, yeah, this one's not organic, but still very good filling food that does not have a negative impact on the blood sugar. And what I've been finding is that these low glycemic foods really help your body. It's just like conditioning that process. I've done some stress tests since I've been on this program um, where I just threw a bunch of, you know, food into my system that was like 200 grams of carbs. 
uh, 58, 100 grams of sugar, like really intense uh, to see what my body would do after it's been conditioned by eating these foods. And um, it, at one test, it was below 100 after that. And another test, it was like at 120 or something. It was really impressive. So um, water obviously is essential and that's, that's part of this program. I wanna talk a little bit about, oh, for the bread, I sometimes will toast that one or two slices and have it with Smart Balance. There's other similar products out there you can try, but I do find the Smart Balance is nice. It has uh, some good omega-3s in there. Salsa is good to throw in. Um, it's tasty, satisfying, and very low in, in calories. Hummus is another good product. It's higher in calories, right, because it's uh, here for this one, 70 calories for like two tablespoons, okay? So you're going to get a lot of calories from this, but it's satisfying and does not have um, any carbs and doesn't have any sugar. Oh, wait a minute. Carbs, four grams, okay? And then, uh, but sugar, zero. So it depends on the hummus product you use. Cottage cheese, and I've, I've done some videos about this before, so I'll keep this short. Um, and I'll include some links in this video. You'll see up here on the right and down below in the YouTube and on the website. Uh, so you can find out more about my video on cottage cheese. But basically, here's the thing. You, if anyone is atrophied at all, either due to a medical condition, if your muscle tone is not what it should be, or due to a dietary situation, like let's say you're a you know, really focused vegan, you're not getting as much protein as you need, um, or maybe that's just been a goal of yours, your long distance run or whatever, you don't have the muscle mass and the muscle tone. Well, as I was saying earlier, that's, that's the little factory that burns up all the sugar in your bloodstream, right? So people that generally don't have a lot of muscle tone are at risk of um, diabetes or insulin resistance. Well, <clears throat> getting some protein sources in our, our uh, diet is really essential. So cottage cheese in a half a cup has this one organic again, 13 grams of protein. So a cup, 26 grams of protein, that's like a nutrition bar. Now I can show you a nutrition bar that has 26 grams of protein, um, but instead of having, you know, six grams of sugar and three carbs, three grams of carbs, it would have like 50 grams of sugar and 50 carbs, right? So cottage cheese is a great source of protein and you'd be surprised a lot of the nutrition products, the, the nutrition products out there, whether it's shakes or bars or whatever, are loaded with sugar and they're loaded with carbs and they're loaded with a bunch of other stuff that you don't need. Um, and then finally milk. I know some people try to avoid milk because of lactose intolerance and, and so that's gonna vary depending on the person. Um, one thing I've found is that I tend to have some kind of like an allergic reaction to milk in general but when I switch to organic milk, those I stop noticing those things. So um, I've, I've switched to an organic whole milk. This one's the Kelowna Supernatural, but there are probably products out there where you live that are similar. Um, but you might try that. If you've had some trouble with almost like allergic reaction to milk products, try some organic products and see if, you know, maybe it is the long list of additives that they feed those cows, those milk cows, whether it's, um, you know, the... Uh, antibiotics that they're giving them or whatever kind of things, you know, that's obviously getting into the milk. And so going with an organic source is better. Well, that pretty much covers the, uh, you know, the three main categories of what I wanted to share. And I'm going to be certainly sharing more through videos and through articles, but it was important to get this again out on the web to kind of document time code, uh, time and date stamp this um, program and keep it flowing forward with the collaborative open source goals that I mentioned earlier. Oh, and just as a conclusion, again, <clears throat> when you just go down the aisles and you're looking for something healthy, this product is it's called Good Natured, right? And it's, it's baked vegetable crisps. Um, and, and these are the kinds of things I post on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I posted about this earlier. You look at the front of this and you see the, the red pepper and the spinach and the carrots, right? This is nutritious, it's gotta be, right? Well, you know, you take a look at the ingredients, this has more sugar, more sugar in these than carrots, red peppers, garlic, spinach, all those things pictured on the front, onions, there's more sugar than all of that on, on the ingredients. So you've gotta be careful about, you know, grabbing for even like sweetened teas, 
those things, sometimes they'll have more sugar than a can of Coke, you know? So it, it's really kind of sad that the, the products people are turning to for a nutritious uh, alternative are often worse than just the regular foods out there. Uh, and again, it's unfortunately people in the industry that are turning to sugar, which is something known to be addictive and, and getting you to eat more. It's like that old Doritos commercial used to say, I bet you can't eat just one. There are things that can get, you know, you can get put in foods that really make them addictive. So um, anyway, thanks for watching. I know this video has been kind of lengthy, but I really wanted to include that complete list of, uh, you know, where I'm at at this point with the program and I'll be posting more in the future. So feel free to contact me through resourcesforlife.com or the aboutgregjohnson.com website. And I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks.